Welcome everyone to Hartford Christian Church. We are so glad that you've joined us for our worship service today. And may I say, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Hopefully you got yourself a nice breakfast in bed or some nice cards or goodies this morning. And if you haven't gotten those things yet, uh, kids and dads, and you know, you need to get on that stuff. Make sure that the moms in our lives feel loved and appreciated. We're so glad that you've joined us today. And if you are uh, with us for the very first time, we want to extend a special welcome and let you know that you are our guest and we're so glad that you have worshiped with us today. Uh, I'm going to start with just a few announcements and then we'll go right into our worship time. So first things first is that we will still be online for the next week after this. Um, and then we'll be discussing over the next few weeks about a plan for when we might be able to get back to in-person services. We actually have a board meeting scheduled for this Wednesday for the elders and deacons. So we're gonna be praying about and planning uh, what that would look like to start having services in our building again. So if you would please lift up our church board in prayer this week, on Wednesday especially, we would really appreciate that. I also wanna say a huge thank you to everyone who took part in our 24 hour prayer vigil for the National Day of Prayer. That was just amazing, the response that we had. We had every single minute covered in prayer. And I was just so glad to partner with our church on that. I, I, just, I just know that was a, an awesome thing. It really meant a lot to me to see our church family united together in prayer like that. So thank you and keep praying for one another. That was awesome. Don't forget, we are continually looking for people to submit in videos of reading scripture or sharing uh, a favorite Bible story or prayers or doing music or singing, really anything. We're, we're open. If you want to read a story, if you want to do some kind of drama or something, we would love to have that. I just love seeing videos from our church family. So please let us know if you're interested in submitting a video. We will use them in the worship service. Also, don't forget that if you would like a DVD copy of any of our worship services that we've done online, or any of them before we were online, you can get those for free from church. Just let us know, especially if you know someone, maybe you have a family member that can't get online and they would like to still watch these worship services, then just let us know. We'd be happy to, to make a, a DVD for them and, and bring it out to them, along with if they need communion or anything. We'd love to be able to help them with that. So just let us know, message us on Facebook or call us at the church office. So now as we turn to our worship time, I'm reminded of the, the old saying about moms. It says a mom, when seeing that there are four pieces of pie left to feed five people, will promptly say, I never really did care much for pie. And I think about the type of sacrificial love that mothers have shown and it reminds me of the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It says this, beginning in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And as we think about the loves that the love that our moms have showed to us, we can see so much of that in this chapter. But even more than that, we think about the love that God has shown to us, that unending, amazing love that sent Jesus to earth, that sent him to the cross. And so we celebrate that this morning as we go to him in worship. Let's pray together. Lord, we just worship you this morning. We thank you for the godly mothers that you placed in our lives. We thank you for their example, and we pray a blessing on all the moms. We thank you for the love that you've given to us through Jesus. We thank you that we can be here today and worship you. So may you be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we get started with our worship service, we're going to watch a little video about the different mothers of the Bible, and hopefully uh, that can relate to the different types of moms that there are out there. Because I know that there are a lot of different, different people that have different styles, different, different ways they relate to motherhood. So um, we're going to do that. And then we're going to go on top to a time of worship with uh, David and Tanya Joyce. So here's the video.
Motherhood plays an important role in the Bible. It binds the beginning and the end. These stories offer us a glimpse into the heart of God, and so we start at the beginning. Taken from the side of Adam, gifted with bringing forth life, the first woman was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. But she was also a mother in her own right, the first of many mothers to come. Though Sarah's womb was closed, God promised nations and kings would come from her. Ten years pass and motherhood seems as impossible as the day it was promised. But the Lord is faithful to keep his promises and Sarah bore a son who made her laugh. Leah was the firstborn, overlooked by her husband Jacob, who gave his heart to her younger sister. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Despite Jacob's disdain, she found her motherhood in the Lord. When Pharaoh became angry at the fruitfulness of the Hebrews, Jochebed sacrificed her motherhood for the sake of her son. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, she had compassion on him. Because of Jochebed's sacrificial motherhood, the Israelites found freedom. Naomi was a mother who experienced the loss of her sons, yet she gained a daughter in Ruth who declared, for where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Naomi and Ruth became family by faith. Mary, a virgin and not yet married, was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The motherhood of this blessed woman was more than the continuation of a family name, but a means for God to bring a savior into the world to save his people from their sins. From the garden to the cross, there have always been mothers. These women paved the way for all women, representing the full spectrum of the ways one could be called mom. Whether a mother in faith, mentorship, adoption, or by birth, you play an important role in the stories of generations to come. To all the Sarahs, Leahs, Jochebeds, and Naomis, Happy Mother's Day.
all eyes on you until the day you call me home. Singing, oh, Lord, keep me in the moment. Help me live with my eyes wide open. I don't want to miss what you have for me. Singing, oh, Lord, show me what matters. Go away when I'm chasing after. Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me. Well, thank you, David and Tanya, for truly leading us in the heart of worship. Now, as we prepare for communion, go ahead and, and grab your cups if you've got them with you. If you don't have one of these, you can grab some crackers or bread or juice or whatever you have available. And remember, you can always pick these up for free from church throughout the week. Or if you're shut in and you need someone to bring them to you, just let us know and we'd be happy to bring you communion as well. If you are a Christian and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are welcome to participate with us in this communion service. 
As we get those things ready, I'm going to turn to John chapter 19 for our text. John 19, verses 25 through 30. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You know, I think it's important to remember that at the foot of the cross stood Mary, Jesus' mom. Now, if you've ever had to watch your kids go through a difficult situation, maybe it was a medical issue, maybe it was an emotional issue, you know how heartbreaking that is as a parent. And how you wish there was anything you could do to take their pain away and take it on to yourself. Now imagine what Mary was feeling as she saw her innocent son nailed to that cross, beaten, spit upon, and mocked, all for the sins of the world. I'm sure she wanted to take away Jesus' pain, but she knew she couldn't. She knew that this was the reason that Jesus had come. And what I love about this passage is how relatable it is. Jesus on the cross at the end of his life looks down and sees his mom and he loves her. And he takes care of her. And he reminds us that we are never too old to honor our mothers. For many of us, the reason why we're Christians is because of the influence of our mother. But she was there. She was there in his final minutes as he bore the sins of the world on his shoulders. as he uttered those final words, it is finished, you just know that her heart broke. You picture the tears on her face. The tears that each one of us is responsible for. Because Jesus went to the cross for each of our sins. And he bore each of our sins so that we didn't have Because of that, we can be forgiven. In that moment, I'm sure Mary thought her world was ending. But as we know, three days later, Jesus rose from the grave and conquered death. And he gave us hope of life everlasting. Her tears were turned to joy. And so the cross also reminds us that whatever tears we may face in this world, they will be turned to joy when we see Jesus, our risen Savior. So now, as we remember what he did on the cross, let's remember the sorrow, but also the joy and the hope that each one of us has. So we take this bread. It represents the body of Jesus that was nailed to the cross for our sins. Let's take and eat in remembrance of him. Now as we take this juice, we remember the blood that was shed 
that his mom witnessed that was poured out for our sins that washes us white as snow makes us clean before our Heavenly Father so that we can be spotless in his presence. Let's take and drink in remembrance of him. Let's pray together. Jesus, as we picture the cross, as we picture those that were around the cross, we realize the sorrow was not just on you, but on your loved ones, on your friends, and on those who had put their hope in you. So that as your word says, sorrow may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Lord, we praise you that the cross was not the end, that the cross was the end of sin, but that you rose from the grave mightily and victoriously, and you have set all who would put their faith in you free. So we praise you and we thank you for the victory that we had, and we thank you that those tears were wiped away, and we know that someday all sorrow will be no more as we rejoice with you in heaven. We praise your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. What is the best piece of advice that your mom ever gave? Maybe it was something really profound or maybe it was just something for everyday life. You know, I always remember my mom saying little phrases and one that always stuck with me was it's actually a scripture from Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. She would always say, a cheerful heart is good medicine. And I remember that. It just kind of stuck with me. You know, throughout the years, I'm sure we all remember things that our moms have said. There's been plenty of times where we wish that we had our mom right there with us, that we could just ask those questions over and over again like we did when we were younger. You know, so many of us, we have smartphones, and we have Siri and Alexa and all these personal assistants that we ask all the questions to, but they're just not the same as having your mom there. Well, check out this video about what it would be like if we had a mom personal assistant. Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. No, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah. Thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The mom personal assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey, mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. 
But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. Well, could you relate to some of the situations in the video? You know, it would be nice sometimes just to be able to have an assistant that you could just ask those motherly questions to and get the response just like that. But you know, nothing can replace our moms and no smartphone or personal assistant is ever gonna give the same advice that our moms would give. And so today on, on Mother's Day, as we continue through our series on the Lordship of Christ and we're looking at the commands that he gave us, we're continuing in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're just about finished. Jesus is giving us those summary statements, and he's, he's wrapping up what he really wants us to remember. And I think what we will see today is that a lot of the motherly advice that we are given is actually godly advice. And so if you have motherly advice and it's godly advice, then that means you should really listen to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue in Matthew chapter 7, Today, we're going to look at the command of Christ, which is simply walk the narrow road. And we're going to see how stuff that our moms have taught us over the years actually falls in line with what Jesus is teaching us here. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for today. We are thankful for all the moms in our lives. God, and we just thank you for the blessings that they've been to each one of us. And God, we pray that as we look at the words of Christ this morning, that we would take them to heart, that we would honor our moms for what they have instilled in us, but also honor you for what you've called us to do and who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we look at some of the motherly advice that we get, the first one that we're going to see is just simply this. This motherly advice that's also godly advice, don't just follow the crowd. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. See, what Jesus is saying here is the same advice that we've heard from our moms over and over again, which is, if everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you go jump off a bridge? Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean you have to do it. No, just because something is popular doesn't make it true. And just because everyone else thinks that it's right doesn't make it right. You know, there is an overwhelming majority of people in our world, in our country, that believe in heaven. And they believe that they are going to heaven someday. But the percentage of people that believe in hell is much smaller. And I wonder why is that? I think it's because hell is uncomfortable. Hell implies judgment. It implies standards. And, you know, we just don't like to think about those types of things. We like to think that everybody's okay and that everybody's going to the same place and that there's nothing that we really need to worry about. And unfortunately, what's happened is that we've been given this, this false sense of safety. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we continue in the message today. But simply put, following Jesus means following the narrow road. You know, it's really interesting that the narrow road is God's road because God created everything. But yet, in order to be a follower of Jesus, that means we have to decide to make him our Lord and our Savior. And so as we look at what Jesus is telling us in Scripture, he's saying that the majority of people are on the wrong path. Don't just go along with the crowds. And how do we know what path we're on? How do we know that we're following the right path and we're following the right people? He's going to go on to talk about that. But the first point I want us to really get is that only the narrow road leads to life. We have to understand that. Only the narrow road leads to life. 
you might say, well, that sounds kind of difficult. I like what Dr. Timothy Keller has said about the gospel. A couple of quotes. He said, the gospel is an exclusive truth, but it's the most inclusive, exclusive truth in the world. What does he mean by that? I think what he's saying is, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is exclusive. That means that if you are not a believer in Jesus, if you are not a Christian, you cannot get to heaven. That's exclusive. Only through Jesus. You can't believe in any other leader, no other church. Only through Jesus can you be saved. So have you put your faith in him? But it is exclusive, but it's also inclusive in the fact that all are welcome. The invitation to be a follower of Jesus is open to everyone. No matter what you've done, no matter what your past is, no matter what sin you're currently struggling with, Jesus offers the invitation to all. All are welcome to be a follower of Jesus. Now, to be a follower does mean to deny myself and to take up my cross and to follow Jesus. But he'll meet you right where you are. And he wants you to start following him today. You don't have to fix your life before you start following him. You follow him and you let Jesus transform your life. That is why the gospel message is exclusive. Because there's only one way to heaven. But it's inclusive because all are invited. The second thing that Dr. Keller says is this. He says, The gospel says you are more sinful and flawed than you ever dared to believe, but more accepted and loved than you ever dared to hope. You see, the gospel, it calls out the darkness in us. It identifies the sin and it calls us to be free of that sin. And a lot of us, we we just kind of overlook sin. We think that there's no big deal. You know, I'm I'm pretty much okay. I just I just need a little help here and there. The gospel says, no, you are sinful, you are separated from God, and you need a savior, and his name is Jesus. He's the only savior. But it also says that God loved you so much that he sent his son into the world to die for you, to take your place, to pay your debt, to set you free. God did that. You are loved more than you could ever hope. God wants you to accept that. So the gospel message, it's exclusive, but it's also inclusive. I love that. So Jesus says now, as we go through the rest of Matthew 7, he's saying, here's how you can tell if you're on the right path. And the next piece of motherly advice that's also godly advice is to be careful who you listen to. Jesus says there are a lot of false prophets out there. Not every voice that's speaking to you is telling you the truth. And just because they may be screaming the loudest does not mean that they contain the most truth. In fact, a lot of times it's the loud ones that are trying to cover up something. You know, there's an old preacher joke that says that if you forget an idea or if you run out of a point, just pound the pulpit and yell louder. And there's something about that volume that commands attention. But just because there's volume in our life doesn't mean that we should be listening to it. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And so there is a principle here that Jesus tells us. He says, look at the fruit. Look at what a person is doing, what they are saying, what the results are of their life. 
Are they honoring God? Are they leading people to everlasting life in Jesus? What is their fruit? I want to play a little game this morning. Hope y'all are ready. Hope y'all are awake. You've got your coffee and you're, you're, you're ready to play. We're going to identify some things that are fruits and some things that are vegetables. And I want you to play along and guess and see if you can get this. So I'm going to put a picture on the screen and it's going to say fruit or vegetable. And I want you to guess if it's a fruit or vegetable. The first one will go easy. Okay. Here's the first one. An apple. Is an apple a fruit or a vegetable? If you said fruit, you got it. I told you that one was easy. All right, this one might be a little harder. We'll see. Bananas. Are bananas a fruit or are they vegetables? No, they're also a fruit. This one might be a little tricky. Avocado. Is an avocado a fruit or is it a vegetable? It's actually considered a fruit. I didn't know that before I did this. In fact, my daughter Anna and I were kind of arguing about this earlier this week and we found out that avocados actually are a fruit. Okay, here's another one. A potato. Regular potato. Is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? Well, it is a vegetable. Maybe I got you thinking otherwise because we've already looked at three fruits, but no, nope, it's considered a vegetable. What about this one? A sweet potato. Is that a fruit or a vegetable? You say, well, you know, fruit typically is sweet. No, it's actually a vegetable. <laughs> Most of you may, may have known that. All right, what about this one? Bell peppers. Are bell peppers considered fruit or vegetable? Believe it or not, they're actually considered fruit. I wouldn't have thought that. All right, here's the one that gets everybody. Okay, this last one. Tomato. Is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? It's actually a fruit. And it's actually a vegetable too. You would say, well, how is that possible? Well, actually, there was a Supreme Court case in 1893 that said that it was actually a vegetable. See, biologically or botanically, a uh, tomato is a fruit. But in this Supreme Court case, Nix versus Hedden, 149 U.S. 304 in 1893, was a decision by the Supreme Court of the United States that under U.S. Customs Regulations, the tomato should be classified as a vegetable rather than a fruit. The Supreme Court's unanimous opinion held that the Tariff Act of 1883 used the ordinary meanings of the words fruit and vegetable instead of the technical botanical meanings. So what does all that mean? It means that the Supreme Court judged in 1893 that uh, tomato was to be considered a vegetable because vegetables were taxed higher. So they got more taxes on the vegetables. So technically a tomato is a fruit, but legally it's considered a vegetable. So you could actually be either or on that one. So whether or not you got all of those right, if you messed up on all of them or if you knew them all, what was a fruit, what was a vegetable, I bet that what you did know is that a tomato is not going to come from a banana tree. And avocados are not going to come on the same vine as sweet potatoes. It's not going to happen. No, you know what the kind of tree is by the fruit that it produces. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Simply put, good fruit will not come from a bad tree. 
So who are the people that are speaking into your life? Who are the voices that you're listening to? Are they good or are they bad? And if you say, I'm not sure, look at the fruit. You say, what does that mean? Well, are they stirring up anger and dissension? Are they causing you to feel overwhelming guilt and shame? Are they leading to frustration and disharmony? Are they negative? Are they causing you to doubt yourself, to doubt your faith? Are they sowing seeds of strife between you and your loved ones? Or are they building you up? Are they pointing you to Jesus? Are they encouraging your faith? Are they helping you in your walk? Are they bringing you joy or are they taking it from you? You know, sometimes the voices that we listen to that we need to shut off are our own. You know, we talk a lot about right now where we're at with mental health and depression and, and how that's just a real struggle right now. And it's something that I, I've been open about. I've struggled with in the past and I, I am 100% in favor of going to talk to a counselor to go get some help. If you're struggling with any kind of anxiety or depression or mental issues like that, especially now, as there's, there's a lot of worry and a lot of fear and a lot of things that could, could take control of our mind, don't let the negative voices in your own head, don't let your own negative voice lead you away. Take it to God's word. Seek him in prayer. Listen to godly counsel. Worship him at all times. Pray continually. Be thankful for each blessing that God's given to you. Turn over your worries and your fears and your anxiety and your depression and your struggles and all of that over to God. I'm not saying that it's easy, but it will bring you life. You'll know a tree by its fruit. And dead trees, they cause dead things. So look at the voices in your life. Make sure that they are bringing life to you and pointing you to Christ. The next piece of motherly advice that's also godly advice that I want to look at is know where you're going. You know, when I first started driving, both my parents, my mom and dad, you know, they, they were really cautious with me and they would ride with me, you know, when I had my permit. And they'd let me eventually, you know, drive a little bit around town then I'd be able to get on the interstate. Well, I had this best friend. I've mentioned him before. His name's George. Um, he lived about 45 minutes away in Georgetown, Indiana. It's easy to remember, George from Georgetown. And I used to go over his house uh, about once a month or so, or he would come over and we would hang out. And when both of us got to where we could drive, that became a little more fun because we could drive to one another's houses. Well, I remember the first time that I drove to George's house. In fact, the, the first time that I did it, my mom was right there in the passenger seat with me, making sure I got there okay. But then the first time that I did it by myself, I remember my mom wrote out all these directions about when to make this turn and how long to be here and what to look for there and when to turn you know, turn at the McDonald's and go this way. And here's the address and here's the phone number. Because this was, you know, before GPS and, and, and everything. So and she knew at that time that I tend to get lost. <laughs> it's something that it happens to me uh, quite a bit. <laughs> I use GPS frequently. But I just remember how worried she was. And as soon as I got there, I had to call home and let her know that I had gotten there safely. She wanted to be sure that I knew where I was going. Because, really, it didn't matter how good of a driver I was going to be, if I was getting lost, then 
I needed to make sure I knew where I was going. I was going in the right place. So Jesus tells his listeners, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. You know, Matthew 7, 23 is quite possibly the scariest scripture in the Bible. Because Jesus says that on the day of judgment, there will be people standing in heaven before him that said, Lord, I, I prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name. I did mighty things for you. And Jesus is going to look at him and say, I never knew you. And it just reminds us how important it is that our faith in Jesus is genuine. It's not just about coming to church. It's not just about saying a prayer. It's not just about being baptized. It's not just about being a good person. No, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus and you haven't surrendered to him as your Lord and Savior, You're going to end up just like these people when they stand before Jesus. You know, I mentioned earlier that there's so many people that have this sort of false sense of safety. They think, well, I prayed a prayer when I was a kid. Or, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. But there's not that surrender. There's not that repentance. There's not that commitment to Jesus as Lord and Savior. You know, I, from time to time, we'll ask people, is it okay to feel comfortable with where you are with Christ? Now, I don't ever want to mislead anyone. I think that we can be assured of our salvation if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. We don't have to doubt that. But I don't think we need to take it for granted either. You know, I've always been fascinated with compasses. I just think they're neat, how they work, how they use the Earth's magnetic pole to point towards north. You can kind of see, maybe on this compass, you can kind of see where north is. I always think that's interesting. You know, it's just a, a pretty simple device that's been used for thousands of years to guide people to true north, to the right direction. But you know what? The compass it uses magnets, it uses the Earth's magnetic pull. But what happens when you start putting magnets all around it? When there's other false norths? the direction changes. And I think for a lot of us, especially those of us that have been in church for a long time, what happens is we get a lot of things that distract us. And they start to change the direction of our compass. We start to think that things like our comfort is more important. Our traditions are more important. The way we've always done things is more important. Simply attending or believing the right thing, or agreeing with the right political party, or doing the right things outwardly, 
You know, Jesus had a lot to say about the Pharisees who outwardly did the right things, but inwardly were dead inside. Our actions as Christians have to flow out of a changed heart. We can't just go through the motions. The one thing that I've really appreciated about this whole time frame, while it's different that we're online and we're not being able to meet together is it's made us appreciate getting together. You know, in the last week or so, we've had conversations about when we might be able to open up the church doors again and have a service here in the building. In fact, uh, we're going to be having a, a board meeting coming up real soon to discuss a plan of action and what steps we can put in place. And we are really looking forward to that. And I hope that none of us will take that for granted, that we will have that opportunity again to get together. But for so many of us, church has become routine. Our faith has become routine. And when that happens, we really need to be careful. We really need to make sure our hearts are not slowly turning hard. Because that is a real danger. Jesus said to one of the churches in Revelation that you're lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or I would spit. Or because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus says, I want you to be hot. I want you to be on fire for me. Lord, I want you to be ice cold. I would prefer you to be on fire. I want you to be on fire in your faith, but don't just fake it. Don't just ride the fence. Don't just be middle of the road. There's some listening, and maybe you have been, you've been way too comfortable in your faith. Maybe there's decisions that you need to make that you've put off because it's just become part of your, your habit, your lifestyle. Don't let complacency, don't let apathy, don't let routine turn you into one of these people that will stand before Jesus And hear him say, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. So simply put, being a good driver means nothing if you're going in the wrong direction. You can be the best driver in the world, but if your guide is off, if your GPS is off, Maybe, I think we've all probably experienced that, taking a wrong turn somewhere. Doesn't matter how careful of a driver you are, if your direction is off, you're going to end up in the wrong place. One of my favorite bluegrass bands is this band called Balsam Range. And we'd seen them in concert a few times. They got this song that I really love. I've probably mentioned it before. But it's called Any Old Road Road Will Lead You There. And the chorus says, if you don't know where you're going, any old road will lead you there. So if you don't have a plan of where you're going, if you don't know what your final destination is, then it doesn't matter what road you take. Any road will take you to nowhere. Jesus said, broad is the road that leads to destruction. There are many paths, and if you haven't chosen the right path, then you're on that broad road to destruction. Jesus says, choose the narrow road, the road of discipleship, the road of Christianity, of being a follower of Jesus The question really comes down for each of us. The Bible says that we should work out our faith with fear and trembling. We have to examine ourselves and say, am I truly following Jesus? Am I following Jesus with my entertainment choices? Am I following Jesus with my family? Am I following Jesus with my friends? Am I following Jesus in my relationships? Am I following Jesus with my money and my finances? Am I following Jesus at work? Am I following Jesus 
in every aspect of my life? Or am I just going through the motions? Am I putting on a good show? Am I prophesying for Jesus that truly I never know him? Am I truly a Christian? Please don't misunderstand me. If you are in Christ, then you can be assured of your salvation. But don't take it for granted. You know, there's a phrase that we say a lot that I I think sometimes misleads people. It says, God loves you exactly as you are. And that is true. God loves you right now. You don't have to do anything to earn his love. He cannot, will not love you more than he does right now. He loves you the most. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. But... God loves you too much to leave you where you are. He wants to take you right where you are right now. He wants to transform your life. He wants to grow your spirit, grow your faith. He wants you to be on the the path of sanctification. He will justify you in Jesus' name. You can take all of Jesus' righteousness and claim it for yourself when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He loves you right now, right where you're at. But he loves you too much to leave you there. He wants you to change. So, have you put your faith in Jesus? That means that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That means that you trust in him as your Lord and your Savior. Have you repented of your sins? Have you turned away from sin and turned towards God? Have you confessed him as your Lord and your Savior? Have you been obedient to him? Have you been baptized, surrendering to his Lordship? Have you been fruitful? Jesus said you'll know a tree by its fruit. Well, what kind of fruit do you have? Are you displaying the fruit of the Spirit? Or are things like anger and worry and frustration and doubt starting to define your thoughts? Each one of us needs to examine ourselves and turn our eyes back to Jesus. Just like this compass, how it will point us to true north. We need to make sure There's no other forces trying to lead us astray. And here's the beauty of it. Wherever you are right now, you have an opportunity to turn to Jesus. It's not too late. You have this moment to turn your heart over. As we conclude, we go to the heart of the gospel. We've talked about motherly instruction also being godly instruction. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. The fear of the Lord, that means the awe, the reverence, the love, the the passion for Jesus. If you have that, then your soul will be satisfied. Evil cannot overcome you. So I want to encourage you right now. Listen to godly instruction. Mothers and fathers, keep giving godly instruction and wisdom to your kids. Keep speaking truth into their lives. All of us, keep listening to truth. Don't ever think that you've got it all figured out. Don't ever be so hard-headed that you can't change. Because Jesus is in the business of changing lives. And it doesn't just end with your decision to follow him. It is a lifelong process. So if you have a decision that you need to make to return to Christ, to come to him for the first time, then do that today. Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message of the cross, that we need to take the narrow road to salvation. Lord, there are so many things that will distract us to go down the broad path that will lead to destruction. But God, I pray that none of us that are listening today would be on that path, that we would be on that narrow road, that we would listen to the voices that bring us life, that produce godly fruit, that we ourselves would produce godly fruit, and that we would know for certain where we're going. Father God, I pray that you would give us that assurance, that you would give us that peace, that you would give us that hope that can only be found in Jesus. And if there's anyone listening that needs to turn their life over to you today, that you would convict their hearts and they would do that this very moment. In Jesus' name. If you have made a decision for Christ, if you are ready to make him the Lord of your life, I encourage you to not let another moment slip away. Make that decision to follow him right now and let us know. Comment on social media, on Facebook or YouTube. Message us. Call us. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. Let you know what it means to be a follower of Jesus and help you on that path. Just because we're quarantined right now doesn't mean that we have extra time that we can wait to make decisions for Jesus. If you need to make a decision right now, you need to do it today. You know, so much of our mother's advice was, was to help us become the people we are today. And so I'm so thankful for all the moms, all the godly mothers who have invested in the lives of the next generation. And those who are currently doing it right now, thank you for sharing Jesus. Know that even if you don't ever receive any reward in this world, that Jesus knows and he sees and he's keeping track. The Bible says we will be rewarded for what we do in this life, in the life to come. So keep speaking truth, keep encouraging people to grow in their faith, Keep turning people to Jesus. Thank you for all who have invested in the lives of others. Thank you to all the moms that are here. If you haven't already and you're able to, call your mom, text your mom, tell her that you love her. Tell her how happy you are that she's your mom. If you don't have that ability right now, say a prayer. Thank, thank the Lord for, for godly mothers that have inspired us to be who we are today. Thank you for joining us this worship time. We're so glad that you're here. If there's anything we can do to help you during this time, please call us or message us here at the church. We'd love to pray with you and help you. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Happy Mother's Day once again, and God bless. Thank you.